Okay, before I start, um, I have a confession to make. Uh, I'm in love with Cruz Koroshvar Klausenberg. Um, this isn't just something to say, this is very sincere. I have traveled in nearly 90 countries, but I am incredibly proud to call this home. And uh, I just want to, before starting, also congratulate the organizers and congratulate everybody who's here for the fantastic event that we're having today. Um, now starting, uh, I want to begin speaking with you about something that I'm very passionate about, something that excites me. And that is our ability as a species to innovate, uh, our ability to create something new, to take an idea and to be able to create a greater value for ourselves, for our communities, for the world. As a species, we have a long history of innovation. One of the people that I look to often for inspiration when I need it is Da Vinci, some of his early drawings. Um, the light bulb, fantastic innovation. You don't realize how amazing it is until you have to try living without one. Um, iPhone, that's pretty exciting. I saw a lot of them around the room today already. How many people know what this is? These are the, the little lights you see on the side of the road. Not always on the side of the roads in Romania, but there's more of them now than, <laughs> than there used to be. Another shot. Um, this itself is a product of innovation. I actually learned this in a fantastic TED video. Man driving home late at night, and on the side of the road, he saw a cat. Um, that's actually a lion, so I hope it wasn't that type. Uh, but he saw the eyes of a cat. What he realized was how visible they were, and from that, he recognized that putting those little lights on the side of the road could help save people's lives. Innovation. As a species, we've um, made ourselves able to fly. If you had told people that a few hundred uh, years ago, they probably would have thought you were crazy. Um, we've put people into space, and that has given us the opportunity to see this incredible picture, which no matter how many times I see it, still inspires. But together with innovation, we also have challenges. There's actually a lot of them. We've spoken a lot about things locally within our community. What I want to try and do is also help us to realize that our community is connected with communities all around the world. And that we're part not only of Cluj, Kolesvar, Klausenberg, we're also part of a broader world together. Some of those challenges, pollution on a massive scale. We can create, we can innovate, but at the moment we are also producing overwhelming amounts of pollution that are affecting the planet that we live in, contributing also to climate warming. Now whether you agree with and believe in climate warming or not, the reality is we do know that temperatures are changing, it's having impacts on societies and communities around the world, especially uh, countries in the south where fertile soil that used to produce what we just saw in the last video is now being turned into desert land. It's, it's reducing their capacity for production. Small islands, coastal areas. Um, we've also had historical experience in the past of major shifts in temperature that have affected species that existed at that time and brought about results that most of us probably don't want to have happening today. Um, in addition to pollution, climate change, we have natural disasters. This is from the tsunami just a few years ago. This is a picture of what it looked like in Aceh just after the tsunami. I was in Aceh just a few months before doing a program with business leaders, religious leaders, students, rural workers, people who are working within their community to try and bring an end to a war that had affected that area for many, many, many years. Almost every single one of them was killed in the tsunami. These were the leaders of their community. Um, this is the recent earthquake in Haiti. More than 20,000 children die every single day from a lack of access to medicine and clean water, which already exist. 15 million children under the age of five are dying every single year from a lack of food, while in supermarkets in Western Europe and North America, we're throwing out more food than everything provided by aid and development assistance put together, and far more than enough to feed people worldwide. This is a result of choices that we're making. It's a result of our political and economic systems, which every single one of us is contributing to. 
Um, illiteracy, we're getting a lot better at this if you look at the numbers from the United Nations, but still far too many people, children and adults around the world who aren't able to read. Um, HIV AIDS, here's real political leadership, Nelson Mandela raising awareness about the issue. Malaria, still one of the greatest killers, especially of children worldwide. So how do we deal with challenges? My presentation, I want us both to recognize and be aware that there is a broader world that we're living in. There are a lot of challenges, but also to try and see what can we learn? What is the inspiration we can draw from some of the ways we've dealt with challenges? The first one is something that I also learned about in a TED video. How many people recognize what this is? Many of you are actually probably too young to have even been around when these pictures were taken. This is smallpox. Smallpox is seen as having been the worst killer in history. Um, killed more people than all of the wars in the world put together. More than 500 million people died as a result of smallpox. It was believed by many to have been what was referred to in the Bible and others as the plague. In fact, it was believed by many to be the wrath of God upon those who sinned. 1967, 34 countries. 1970, 18 countries. 1975, five countries had high levels of smallpox. By 1980, smallpox had been eradicated. How did it happen? happened because people decided to make it happen. We committed our human and scientific resources to overcome one of the greatest challenges and sicknesses that had faced us, something that for many centuries we thought there was nothing we could do anything about. That's just the way it is. The United Nations created the largest campaign in UN history, 150,000 doctors, nurses, medical health volunteers from all over the world, every culture, every religion, every background, came together in a common effort and helped to eradicate smallpox. Fantastic video with Larry Brilliant on TED.com if you want to see more about it. Um, another inspiration for me, medicine. I find the field of medicine to be incredibly inspiring. Do we have any doctors in the room? I saw a few tags earlier, a few up in front. Um, originally, in almost every society and culture around the world, we have traditionally believed that illness, sickness and disease were the result of God's will. Um, in fact, a long time ago when da Vinci was doing his drawings and we were studying medicine, in many parts of Europe and elsewhere, you could be put to death for trying to study human anatomy. It was seen as devil worshipping. Um, today, one of the best things you can do is be a doctor. It's something that makes parents very happy. We train doctors, we train nurses, we have medical health teams, we have community health workers. We have Ayurvedic medicine, acupuncture. We have an incredible breadth of medical health professions. We build hospitals, things that just a few centuries ago we wouldn't have even imagined, or very few did pharmacies so that we can go get our medicines if we need them, rapid response capacity in the form of ambulances and airlift, and an incredible amount of technology and research and development. That's not actually what excites me most about medicine. This is. Can anyone guess what that's a picture of? One of the most important innovations in quality of life for human beings, the invention and the application of sewer systems to our cities. Because if you live in a large urban area like Cluj and you don't know how to get rid of your waste, then you will have plague and disease again. And the other incredible development, clean water. According to the World Health Organization, clean water is responsible for more than 90% of the increase in human lifespan over the last century. Clean water. Something so easy and yet hundreds of millions of people don't have it. Fire. It's also something I find inspiring. Um, Prometheus taking fire down from the heavens so that people could have it. One of the early stories teaching you maybe you shouldn't innovate or be too adventurous. This is what happened to him for it. Um, but we've had fire for a long time. Sometimes it doesn't always work out that well. Forest fires. Uh, this is a famous picture of Rome burning. There's Nero down in the corner. Uh, the great London fire. Chicago. What do we do about it? 
we've actually been extraordinary as a species in trying to find ways of dealing with fire. We have uh, fire hydrants. We have warnings about areas at risk. This is amazing. If you showed a picture like that to someone just a few centuries ago, it would have seemed out of this world. Today, very ordinary. Fire alarms, early warning, let us know when it's happening. Evacuation plans, early firefighter, more recent ones. Training, we train professionals for how to deal with it. We've built fire trucks. This is an early one. This one I love, you've got the picture up here. On the side, it's written, same day response. That's fantastic. <laughs> You've got a fire and they are guaranteed to be there that day, <laughs> sometime. So we've improved it a little bit. We've innovated and today we've got fancy technology like this. We've got helicopters and planes doing airlift, but we also invest in fire prevention. So we've recognized that it's not enough to identify a problem, we need to work to prevent it. We can see areas at risk by space with satellite and also identify where they are. We create buildings so that they're fire resistant. A fire breaks out, it still won't burn down the building. We even design our cities to introduce city blocks. Because in the olden days, when urban areas were more crowded together, the fires would leap and spread. By creating the blocks between them, those are fire breakers. They also let you get to where the fire is to put it out. All of these have involved paradigm shifts, changes in our ways of understanding and seeing the world from what we assumed was the necessary, unchangeable, God-given way things were to recognizing that something else is possible. But paradigm shifts don't just happen. They happen because people make them happen. From the Ptolemaic system, believing that the universe revolved around the sun, to the solar system. Or, sorry, believing the universe revolved around the earth, to the Copernican solar system. From the belief that the world was flat and actually killing and imprisoning people who said it was round, to recognizing that, oh, actually, it is round. Um, Newtonian physics to quantum physics, the idea that women are property to seeing women as human beings with human rights, from the divine right of kings to again human rights and democracy, from there's nothing I we can do to I we can. And as Gandhi said, fis kimbare pika vre sauves. Be the change you want to see in the world. So that takes me to what I'm really here to talk about today, and that's war. Like the other things we've looked at, many people have believed that war is inevitable, that there's nothing you can do about it, that it's part of human nature. This is a famous picture from uh, the Second World War, more recently from Iraq. This is a picture of a girl who literally had the clothes burned off her body when a napalm bomb was dropped on her village. The part of the story that you may not know, for those already familiar with the picture, is years later she's traveling around the world with the man who dropped that bomb. And they are trying together to raise people's awareness that war is not necessary, war is destructive, and we need to find alternatives. The funny thing is, if I tell you the word soldier, almost everybody knows what that is. But how many amongst you would have a clear idea of what a peace worker is? And the reason is, we train soldiers. Here's a child trained as a soldier. Um, I've spoken with veterans who are 14 years old. They started fighting when they were eight. Um, this is how we're training far more people. Computer games, very popular today, originally developed for the military to increase what they call the killingness ratio of their soldiers. Today, millions of children around the world are playing them. And hundreds of thousands of children are child soldiers. This is how much we're spending on War, I wouldn't call it defense, we now have had a 48% increase in military budgets in the last 10 years. We spend more money on war than any period in the existence of the human species. We spend next to nothing on education, social spending, health care. The blue is what we spend on war, the other one's on development cooperation, much less. And you can see we're spending more on producing weapons than we've ever done before in history, much more than during the Cold War. This, in 1996, represents the world's military spending. This represents the most ambitious budgets of the United Nations for dealing with all the world's problems. These are the largest sums they could imagine for preventing soil erosion, stabilizing populations, uh, ending deforestation, clean water, eliminating illiteracy. Those are choices that we make. This is where our money goes. 
the stealth bomber, the only military piece of machinery that is worth more in uh, its cost than if you made it out of gold. Conflicts. War isn't necessary. Conflicts are normal. Doesn't matter where you come from in the world, what your religion, your background, your politics, your gender, your class, all of us have conflicts. It's normal. Conflicts can drive innovation. Almost everything that we know, that we celebrate, has come also out of conflicts. But conflicts and violence are not the same thing. Violence is what happens when we systematically fail to deal with conflicts effectively. And violence is not only happening in war zones around the world, we have it in our communities. We have it in how we treat ourselves. We have it in how we speak with each other. We have it in some of the worst rates in the European Union here for domestic violence. More women are killed in their homes every single year globally than in all the wars in the world put together. What is peace? Peace is a practical reality. It is as real and available to us as health. And the same way that a few centuries ago we believed that sickness and illness was inevitable, you could do nothing about it, but today we train nurses and doctors, we can also train people to deal with conflicts more effectively. In fact, next week here in Cluj, we're having people from all around the world come together to learn how to deal with conflicts more effectively. Gandhi, what I love most about him is that he was just an ordinary human being. Rosa Parks. African-American woman who sat down on a bus because she didn't want the color of her skin to dictate the rights that she had and she dared to stand up for it. These are chill, uh, youth sitting at a um, cafeteria bar where they weren't allowed because of the color of their skin. Martin Luther King who had a dream. These are the people in the Philippines during the People's Power Movement. The Berlin Wall coming down, a result of non-violent action, non-violent struggle, something that many people thought was impossible. Nelson Mandela, you know the funny thing about Nelson? He was on the US terrorist list longer than any other human being alive. <laughs> and yet we admire him. But the funny thing is, if I ask students or members of governments around the world to give me the names of 10 wars throughout history, all of them can do it. If I ask them to give me the names of 10 military leaders, it's easy. But if I ask them to give me the names of 10 nonviolent heroes, of 10 conflicts that have been transformed through peaceful means, we can name Mandela, we can name Gandhi, but usually that's it. The reality is we have an incredibly rich history. We have an amazing breadth of knowledge about how we can deal with conflicts. But we need to make the choice to say that it's worth learning it. All of us learn maths, because it doesn't matter if we're artists, if we're business people, if we're journalists, it doesn't matter what we do, we use maths. All of us have conflicts. It doesn't mean we deal with them well. Just a few more pictures before going. These are the women of Greenham Commons who are demonstrating against the military base in their country. This is one man who stood up in the face of insurmountable odds. Beijing, in front of the tanks. This is a woman whose father was killed in the troubles in Northern Ireland. This is the man who killed her father. And they work together. Not because they have it in theory, but because they know the reality of it. And they know that we have to find another way. These are parents of bereaved in Israel and Palestine from both sides. American soldiers who fought in Iraq and want the war to end. Israeli and Palestinian fighters who are now working together, called combatants for peace, because they're tired of the occupation, they're tired of the war, and they know that if we want to have a shift, it has to come from us. This is February 15, 2003, largest demonstrations in the history of human existence. 15 to 20 million people worldwide saying, we want an end to war. Did they stop the war in Iraq? No. Did the first person who practiced medicine stop all dying? No. The funny thing is, we haven't stopped death and illness because we study medicine. We study medicine because we recognize how important it is. And you don't call a doctor naive by saying, ah, it's human nature to die. Why would you do that? It is in our nature. We do have too many conflicts sometimes, and it's because of their cost that we need to make the choice. I have only a few seconds left. So just a few more pictures. These are people professionally trained as nonviolent civilian unarmed peace workers that go into areas affected by armed conflict. These are people from around the world, including one who's in this audience, uh, Karina Simon, who are working to create ministries and departments of peace in our governments. We have ministries for sport, ministries for war, ministries for health, ministries for science. Some of us are saying, 
We have enough conflict and violence in our communities, in our countries, internationally. Let's also build our government capability to deal with this effectively. And just the last things I want to share with you. The first, Ubuntu. Does anyone know that word from before? It's a Bantu word from South Africa. It means, I am who I am because of you. We are who we are because of each other. The second quote is also one of my favorite by Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. How does this link to Cluj? We have a Romanian Peace Institute based here in Cluj. We're doing this work, and we're doing it all over the world. But the most important way it links is that this is about making a choice. It's about asking ourselves, what is the type of community, what is the type of world that we want to live in? It's about not allowing the cowardism of cynicism to overwhelm us, but to recognize that throughout human history, yes, we have faced many challenges and we continue to. And one of the greatest capabilities of human being is the ability to innovate and together to meet the challenges we face. Mulțumesc, danke schön, și